Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2012 Menzies Scholars Lecture, the inaugural Menzies Scholars Lecture, an event that we hope will become a highlight of your calendar each year. This afternoon certainly promises to be a cracking start. My name is Tim Thwaites, I'm a science writer and broadcaster and will be your MC for the afternoon. Now it's my pleasure to ask the Executive Director of the Menzies Foundation, Professor John Matthews AM, to tell you a little bit about the Foundation and this event. Professor Matthews. Thanks, Tim. Um, it's a privilege on behalf of the Foundation to welcome you to this historic building today. Uh, the building's actually owned by the National Trust and uh, the renovation you can see all around you was uh, paid for by the Foundation when it was established over 30 years ago. And we hope that while you're here, you will just take a little time to look at some of the artefacts and souvenirs uh, in the building. In welcoming you, we must also just draw your attention to the work of the Menzies Foundation. There is some material on the seats uh, before you. Um, the foundation was established in 1979 as a non-political, non-for-profit organisation to perpetuate the ideals of Sir Robert Menzies. And those of you who are as old as me will remember Menzies. And, um, who was Australia's longest serving Prime Minister. We support a program of prestigious postgraduate scholarships and Julian Savalescu, our lecturer today, is one of our most famous uh, Menzies scholars in medicine. The Foundation also provides leadership through a range of activities um, workshops on matters of public importance and it's also nurtured health research through its role in establishing the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin, the Menzies Research Institute in Tasmania and the Menzies Centre for Health Policy in Sydney and Canberra. And we believe through our strategic leadership in scholarship, research and ideas the Foundation really is promoting the ideals of Sir Robert Menzies and we really believe we're a foundation for the future. It gives me great pleasure then to welcome you and to pass it back to Tim who will introduce our lecturer this evening. Thank you. Thank you, John. Now to our speaker. Professor Julian Savalescu holds the Uhiro Chair of Practical Ethics at the University of Oxford and is also a distinguished visiting professor at Monash University. He epitomises everything that the Menzies Foundation is about. He trained in medicine, bioethics and analytic philosophy and before moving to his current position at Oxford in 2002, he was director of the ethics program at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. After having completed a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at Monash University and a PhD under the supervision of Professor Peter Singer, he won the Sir Robert Menzies Memorial Scholarship to the UK in 1994. And that is, I suspect, how he, became, how he came to be associated with Oxford University in the first place. He engages in research, education and stimulating discussion around the ethical issues which arise in everyday life. After Julian's lecture, there'll be time for questions and after that, some light refreshments. So without more ado, Professor Julian Savalescu. Thanks very much, uh, Tim, and I'd, I'd like to first of all begin by thanking the Menzies Foundation for the quite 
strategic uh, support that I received at, at one of the most important times of my career. Somebody once asked Napoleon, what is the, what is the quality you most want in your generals? And he said, luck. Uh, and I, um, I've been certainly myself very lucky to have had the Menzies support. I, at the time, got uh, several scholarships. Uh, one was a four-year um, public health uh, research and development scholarship from the National Health and Medical Research Council. So that was for four years, and the Menzies scholarship was for two years. And um, the public health one gave me one year overseas. And I, I thought long and hard about this, and I, I really wanted to, to spend some time overseas. So I, I took the Menzies ahead of the longer, um, also more well-funded scholarship. A and that turned out to be a, a good decision because it was only in the second year that, that things really got going for me in Oxford. I mean, for, for those of you who have kind of travelled, it often takes a year to settle in. And the second year I was able to be a clinical ethicist in the Radcliffe Hospital. So. You know, it, I think it's quite reasonable to say without the Menzies scholarship, I wouldn't have a chair in Oxford now because I wouldn't have had the uh, personal support uh, from people in Oxford that enabled me to get a chair at the age of 37. So uh, just as another anecdote, I was interviewing some students. I run a collaborative program with uh, Monash taking medical students in Oxford. And one of the students was very worried that she might not be able to do ethics. And she said, what are the qualities that you look for? It's a little bit like, I felt a little bit like Napoleon. What are the qualities that you look for in you know, somebody who can do you know, good ethics and, and you know, will succeed in philosophy? And I said, hard work. And, and that's the truth in anything. It's really hard work. So um, uh, you know, I've been very lucky. Um, and I've also appreciated the hard work of the Menzies Foundation. Sandra McKenzie was here when I began. I gather she's been here for the life of the program and she's soon to retire and, and she was a fantastic person supporting me over there. So uh, the topic of tonight's talk is the ethics of diagnosis and treatment, but I've added another title, a subtitle. It's called Reconceptualising the Goals of Medicine. So many people think that ethics is kind of important in, you know, when you're talking about euthanasia or assisted suicide or maybe in deciding what, which treatments get funded. But actually ethics is essential to every single decision that's made in, in, in medicine because medicine is not a purely technical enterprise. It's about making decisions. And in order to make decisions, you need two things. You need facts about the world, which science provides us, and you need values. So nothing, no scientific statement or set of facts will tell you what you should do. You have to have a set of values in order to decide. Now, most of the time, that used to be very uncontroversial in medicine. People had, you know, a, a streptococcal infection. You give them penicillin because they want to live. It's not very controversial that you know it's a bad thing to die generally. But more and more, um, medicine has been able to do more and more things to people, uh, and people have come to want different things and have different values. So we start to see the beginning of, of, of this contentious issue of how should values play out in medicine. And I'm going to argue tonight that medicine is not just about treating and preventing disease as pathology, it's about enhancing life, using the knowledge from the biological sciences. Well, let me start with an illustration of just how important ethics is. In fact, it has lethal implications. So a couple of years ago, Teresa Lewis, um, died on the 24th of September after being given a lethal injection in Virginia, in the United States. The 41-year-old was convicted of plotting to kill her husband, Julian Lewis, and her stepson, Charles Lewis. She persuaded two men to carry out the murders in return for sex and money. The two men received life sentences, but she was sentenced to death. The execution went ahead in spite of protests from lawyers, celebrities, and others who argued that she should have been cle given clemency because of her low IQ. Under United States law, anyone with intellectual disability is not given the death penalty. They're given life imprisonment. Lewis was judged to have an IQ of 72. Unfortunately for her, the definition of intellectual disability is an IQ of less than 70. So she missed out by two points and was executed. Now, the derivation of what constitutes an intellectual disability, or essentially a, di a disease, comes from looking at the distribution of intelligence across the population. 
And the IQ of 70 is two standard deviations below the mean. That means that 2% of people have intellectual disability. Now, where did that figure come from? Was, was this a matter of a scientific inquiry or great ethical analysis? It was purely arbitrary. It was chosen as a, st as a statistical point two standard deviations below the mean. It could have been set at one standard deviation below the mean, which means that anyone with an IQ less than 85 would be intellectually disabled. Now, this definition of what a disease is served very useful functions. It enabled scientists to research on certain things, people to get receive social benefits or have excuses, as in this case, from work or their roles in society. So it was a reasonable rough and ready figure. But should somebody's life depend on whether their IQ is 69 or 71, it makes no functional difference to their ability to appreciate what they're doing, those two IQ points. Of course, the law has to draw lines. And inevitably, cases will fall on either side with sometimes drastic consequences. Um, but the, the law here has been based on what was seen as a scientific fact, that disability is an IQ less than 70. But that was a creation. So our definition of disease evolved to deal with certain features of ourselves and the world to enable people to get access to mainly life-saving treatments. But of course, we live in a completely different era and we need to redefine and re-understand what is disease and what is medicine. So not only can ethics have lethal consequences because the decision to make uh, the IQ of intellectual disability 70 was an ethical decision, not a scientific one, uh, it can also have widespread, more general consequences. So, for example, uh, in the United States, you need an IQ of 90 to complete a tax return. Now, the average is 100, which means roughly about 20% of people who are normal lack the ability to, to complete uh, a tax return. Now, we could change our definitions of disease, or we could acknowledge that people who are normal are often profoundly disadvantaged and can also benefit from medical interventions. So I, I was asked earlier this year to, to talk about um, a program that was evaluating the psychological health of young children as, as young as the age of three. And I wrote a short piece uh, for the age that I'm going to cover some of now. But then I want to put this in a more general context about how we need to, to re-evaluate the goals of medicine. So there appears to be, if you look at the statistics, an epidemic of mental illness. Depression is the fourth leading cause of disability and disease worldwide. The World Health Organization projects that it will be the leading cause in developed countries by 2020. The leading cause of disease and disability will be a mental illness. Over 20 million people in the United States suffer from social anxiety disorder. They get anxious in social situations. 20 million people. There's a 15% chance that all of it, that that you in the room will suffer from one of these two mental disorders. So it's become very common to suffer from a mental disorder that entitles you and often warrants treatment. Worse, this apparent epidemic of mental illness is spreading to children. In New Zealand, 12% of children now are medicated, medicated not just diagnosed, but medicated for attention deficit disorder. So a few years ago, there was no such mental illness, but now 12% of the children suffer from it. The figures are the same in the UK, around 5 to 9%. And doctors in Australia will soon be screening three-year-olds through this healthy kids check for signs of mental illness, including anxiety, manifested by, amongst other things, sleeping with the light on, temper tantrums, or extreme shyness. Um, they call it, as I said, the mental health, the healthy kids check. Now they aim to reduce behaviours like aggression, difficulty with impulse control and trouble interacting with other children, all, all quite worthy goals. So what's going on? Are, are we changing? Uh, are we unfit for the very high-paced, compressed, alienating, competitive world that we now live in? That's probably part of the explanation. 
But the meteoric rise in mental illness is due, at least in part, to three other factors. Firstly, an increased willingness to diagnose mental illness. Secondly, a relaxation of the criteria. And thirdly, the invention of a whole host of new mental diseases for people to suffer from. So the Bible of psychiatry, there are two Bibles. One is the ICD, I think it must be 10 now, uh, and then which is, which is an international diagnostic um, taxonomy. But the probably more influential is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that the United States produces. And they have a huge process by which they look at the, the criteria for deciding whether somebody is mentally ill or not. And this is revised every few years. And the current draft has been discussed for several years and will come out soon as what's called DSM-5. It's incredibly influential and it determines in the US who will be covered by insurance. So part of the reason for the proliferation of psychiatric diagnoses is that in the United States, in order to get access to drugs and other therapies, including talking therapies, counselling, cognitive behavioural therapy, you have to be diagnosed with a disorder. You can't be normal. You have to have a disease. So part of it is compassion. Probably part of it is a, there's a financial incentive on the part of doctors to find people who can be treated. So. The new, the new uh, DSM-5 will, will come up with new, uh, with, with new psychiatric disorders such as persistent complex bereavement disorder. This is excessive grieving. A relaxation in the definition of alcoholism would mean that 40% of American college students would be diagnosed as alcoholics. <laughs> the APA, the American Psychiatric Associ Association, considered but didn't actually um, agree to uh, a diagnosis of attenuated psychosis syndrome, which means you're not psychotic, but we'll call you psychotic anyway. And internet addiction, as a so when your kids spend hours and hours on the internet, that was what was going to be a psychiatric disorder. They even have a, a definition of ADHD, or attention deficit disorder, without the usual symptoms of ADHD. It's called ADHD, not elsewhere specified. So if, you're, if your child doesn't meet the criteria, it doesn't matter, it can still be treated under this category. PMT is now officially a mental health disorder. It's called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And there's disruptive mood dysregulation disorder in children, which is being a naughty child. And at least one doctor uh, that I know of uh, has, pr has proposed hypoactive sexual desire disorder for low libido. He, in fact, claims to have found that there is, this is a neurological disease because he discovered that different areas of the brain are active in people who have a low libido versus a high libido. Now, anyone who knew the first thing about the brain would not be surprised that there are differences in activity between two different behaviours because it would be amazingly puzzling if the same activity in the brain led to two different sorts of activities of behaviour. So are we pathologising the normal? Well, yes, we are. We are indeed redefining normality as disease. And this has led to the overtreatment of some people and the medicalisation of social problems. Uh, one former head of DSM has even admitted that childhood epidemics of autism, bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder have led to widespread mislabeling and medicating. But part of the reason that there is such an explosion of mental disease is because you can't get access to things that do work for these conditions, these disadvantages, unless you're diagnosed as having a disease. Society steadfastly refuses to accept that it's legitimate to provide drugs and, I guess, other interventions um, to normal people to improve their lives. So I, I have no problem with, with giving children Ritalin or Adderall if it improves their performance at school and their behaviour. Um, but I think it doesn't necessarily follow that they were diseased <laughs> to have an effect because what they're receiving is purely cognitive enhancement. The fact is that a substantial proportion of mental health promotion is the quite legitimate enhancement of normality, helping people to deal with limitations, problems that they face, anxieties that they have, 
and helping them to realise better lives. And that's quite a legitimate function, in my view, of medicine. Even hard psychiatric diseases, like schizophrenia and manic depression, which I think are truly diseases, and there will one day be some pathology identified with these, don't at the moment have any clear pathology. And there's great disagreement about their boundaries and diagnosis. But many of the more modern psychiatric disorders, such as social anxiety and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, are merely symptoms of the human condition. It's important to realise that just because something is normal, though, it's not a reason to stick with it. Many uh, patterns of behaviour that we develop lead to very unhappy lives. Um, the extreme case, cases are addictions. Many people have said that addictions are biological disorders, disorders of the brain, which it's difficult to understand how something like gambling addiction constitutes a, a neurological disorder. In many cases, these are behavioural habits that lead to pathology, but they're not primarily neurological or biological in origin. Now, the best example of how important deviations from normality that aren't diseases can affect people's lives is the work that began with the psychologist Walter Michel over 30 years ago, who studied impulse control or the ability to delay gratification. Now, one of the most important features of being a human being is being able to plan for the future. And we're all presented with, with temptations and rewards now. But often these have to be put aside in order to work for long-term goals, whatever they are, um, whether they're for the benefit of others or for yourself. This is called impulse control, the ability to delay gratification for some future good. When Michelle studied three-year-old children with a marshmallow, you know, the children wanted to have a sweet, placed a marshmallow in front of them and said, don't eat the marshmallow, and when I come back in 10 minutes' time, I'll give you two marshmallows. Very simple test. You can see this on YouTube. There's hundreds of you know, beautiful displays of children sitting on their hands or trying not to look at the marshmallow. <laughs> and some of them succeed and some of them fail. That's what some of them, people eat the chocolate when it's there in front of them. Some people can, can withstand the temptation. Now, what was interesting, though, is 10 years later when he followed them up, the ones who didn't eat the marshmallow had more motivation to succeed, more friends, higher academic scores, uh, greater, greater entry into university. This is more correlated with their entry scores to university than their IQ was. And if you have poor, very poor impulse control, you're very likely to be in the bottom socioeconomic scale and, um, and in jail. So none of you have this, I doubt, because otherwise you wouldn't have this sort of the patience to sit through 30 <laughs> minutes of me talking. Now, poor impulse control, like dyslexia, is not a disease. It's a feature of variation of hu human beings. Some are tall, some are short. Some are smart, some aren't so smart. Some have good impulse control, some have bad impulse control. But it fundamentally affects what you do with your life. Now, if we could change this by the use of medicines or counselling or any other medical intervention, why wouldn't we treat this in the same way that we treat uh, mental, other, uh, mental illnesses, hard mental illnesses. Now, there are costs to pathologising normal people. First of all, there's a stigma. Secondly, it lowers the sense of responsibility. If you've been afflicted by cancer or um, polio or Parkinson's disease or diabetes, it wasn't your fault. The situation that you're in is you know, it's caused by an infectious agent or some biological event that's outside of your control. But if you understand that what you have is not primarily a biological event or insult, then there's some door open for some responsibility. It also labels people as sick or ill and entitles them to excuses that they may not be entitled to. They may not be entitled to, for example, the use of public resources for minor improvements to their life, to their well-being, but which are nonetheless important to them. Um, and it gives them excuses and creates a sense of powerlessness. So it's far better, I think, to say that we're treating normal people for disadvantages that they face, rather than saying we've discovered a new category of sick people. 
Um, there are arguments on the other side. Some people with Asperger's, children with Asperger's syndrome or autism spectrum disorders find some consolation in the idea that they're not responsible for the disorder because it is primarily genetic or biological. So where there is a hard genetic or biological origin, I think it's quite reasonable to say these are hard diseases. But in many other cases, I think we should be talking about life enhancement, not treatment of disease. Now here are some cases of where medicine more broadly is not treating disease, it's making either people's lives better in a more global sense, promoting their well-being, or respecting their autonomy, giving them what's important to them in terms of what they want to do with their life. Abortion. Pregnancy is not a disease. It's, it's, it's far from it, the opposite of disease. It's what evolution aimed at, passing on the genes to the next generation. When doctors perform abortions, they're not, they're not treating a disease. They're enabling women to, or, and couples to have greater control over their reproduction and the planning of their lives. Cosmetic surgery, obviously, is not treating a disease. But in many cases, deviations from normal in children that have significant psychological and social effects are recategorised as diseases to enable cosmetic surgery to be performed. Contraception. Preventing fertility is the opposite. It's inflicting a disease, in fact, because disease, the traditional disease, definition of disease, is a condition of your biology or psychology that reduces your chances uh, of living long enough to reproduce. Okay. So the outcomes that matter from evolution are your, whether you live and whether you reproduce. Not whether you're happy, not whether you have friends, you know, not whether you're successful, not whether you, none of that matters for, for in evolutionary terms. Um, but of course, that matters to us, and that's why we think contraception is something that should be provided to people. At the more extreme end, we've started to see people who feel very different in their own bodies being treated by surgeons. The most extreme case, sex change operation. Have a normal man, anatomically, physiological normal man, who wants to be a woman. Normal penis is excised, a vagina is fashioned, and this is said to be a medical procedure. Now I, you know, I have never seen any hard pathology in this. It's not as if there's a brain tumor causing uh, this, this deviation of sexual identity. I'm not saying that this is inappropriate. I think it is inappropriate, but it's not the treatment of disease. A more extreme case that DSM-5 will include as a new psychiatric disorder, which will be shocking to many of you. But there are people, believe it or not, who have four healthy limbs and request to have one of them amputated. And this will be called body integrity identity disorder. And uh, these people often have sexual fetishes for people with amputations. They go to extraordinary lengths to amputate their own limb. It's resistant to conventional form, all conventional forms of psychiatric therapy. And when the amputation isn't performed, they, they place their leg over a, um, over a railway track um, or attempt uh, auto amputation. So should we be performing amputation in these people? I think it's a difficult question, but it won't be answered by asking, you know, saying, well, now we've invented this <laughs> psychiatric disease body integrity. That's just a redescription of the desires and symptomatology of this condition. More conventionally for you, suicide and euthanasia are areas that challenge the idea that medicine is about curing and about prolonging people's <laughs> lives and even improving them. I've been engaged in a debate around creating, using genetics to select children who start life with greater opportunities and the, the issue of sex selection. Now, sex selection or design of babies are not treating and preventing disease, but they're enabling people either to have children that they desire with the qualities they desire or, or children who have more advantages in life. So, for example, you could choose uh, today to have a child who's less disposed to criminal behaviour under conditions of early childhood abuse. The monoamine oxidase A gene uh, could today be selected um, against uh, to have children who are less likely to be and w less likely to be criminals and more resilient to abuse. So sex selection is a very good example 
we're often um, concerns about harm to other people are invoked. But the harm to other people usually is a disturbance of the sex ratio. And this could easily be prevented by monitoring the sex ratio in Australia or only allowing, it's not me is it, um, by only allowing sex selection for family balancing reasons. If you have a boy, you could have a girl. If you've had a girl, you could have a boy. This wouldn't disturb the sex ratio. And studies in the US and, and the UK have shown that 60% of people prefer to have girls in that situation. So again, this is an area where medicine could be providing people with freedom to choose the makeup of their family without huge social costs. So when it comes to enhancing people's lives and promoting their autonomy, as objects of medicine, how should we weigh this against conventional forms of medicine? How should we decide whether abortion is something we should fund or whether cognitive enhancers for children who perform badly at school that we call attention deficit disorder should be funded from the public purse? Now here the answer has to be uh, we need to measure in some way globally how well their well-being is promoted, how much benefit they're getting in terms of their overall life, their happiness, the ability to satisfy their desires, the ability to develop as human beings, to develop talents, to be successful and so on. All of those things matter and they're the outcomes that we should be comparing with more traditional forms of, of medicine. There are limits, as I said before, the public interest, harm to other people are legitimate reasons for not providing benefits to, to individuals. But as I mentioned in the case of sex selection, we can often prevent these by structuring our policies to limit those side effects. There are also important issues, as I said, about the distribution of limited medical resources. So we have to always make choices about how many people to treat with a given resource. Nobody ever receives the best medical treatment possible. There could always be more time with a counsellor, more time with a doctor, more explanation, a better antibiotic, a better prosthesis. So everyone has to sacrifice something to enable other people to be treated. And how we should decide to fund these sorts of, of improvements of people's well-being will be a part of that equation. Um, it may be less priority than treating cancer or diabetes or heart disease, but it's clearly of benefit and needs to be considered. And when it comes to things like impulse control, I'd argue that these may have quite a high priority because they enable people to lead fundamentally good lives. Okay, so I've argued that medicine shouldn't just be the treatment and prevention of disease. It also should be a life enhancement for people who are patients. That we don't need to call people mentally ill in order to help them. Okay, the la I'm going to finish soon and open it up to questions. But the last section is the most controversial. Because I'm going to argue here that medicine has been and should be used sometimes to benefit other people than the patient. So the medicine that's, that's given to or the procedure that's performed on the patient can legitimately be for other people. Now this is hugely controversial okay? because um, in the past uh, people were horribly treated on these social interest grounds. So for example homosexuality was a disease defined by the DSM, defined by the American Psych Psychiatric Association until 1986 as a disease. And this was on the basis that it offended the morals of a significant part of society. Homosexuals were subjected to painful aversion therapy to make them give up their desires in the 50s and 60s. This was depicted, this sort of therapy, in a clockwork orange. My favourite psychiatric disease, the best illustration of the use of, of medicine and psychiatry for social purposes, is drapetepomania. This was described by the American physician Samuel A. Cartwright, an outstanding doctor of his time in 1851, to describe the disease that caused black slaves to flee captivity. Uh, the former Soviet Union used similar sorts of diagnoses to institutionalise political dissidents as suffering from mental illness. Um, today, DSM-4 uh, describes paedophilia as a disease and psychopathy 
as a personality disorder. There's great discussion at the moment about whether Anders Brevik is mad or bad. If he's diagnosed as mad, he'll go into a psychiatric institution for therapy. Now, through most of human history, it was natural for adults to have sex with children under the age of 16. I'm not, this is clearly not right today, but it's not clear that all cases of paedophilia are a disease. And more importantly, it's not clear that, borderline, that personality disorders such as psychopathy aren't just extreme variants of the human condition. It's continuous with psychoticism and hard-headedness in normal people. All of these tray, these personality disorders, borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorders, are exaggerations of traits that normal people have to greater or lesser degrees. So I am ter pedophilia, terrible crime. But is it the expression of mental illness? I think that's a very controversial thing. These people, are, we say these people are sick, but whether they're not responsible for their behaviour and so on is, I think, open open to discussion. The cases of homosexuality, paedophilia and psychopathy show the dark side of extending medical categories, pathologising the normal. Rather than using, um, rather than saying that these people are mentally ill and so we should be able to treat them, we should ask whether medicine can be used legitimately for social benefit. In the case of homosexuality, it's clearly no. In the case of paedophilia, paedophiles are given hormonal castration in some places, which is female hormones to reduce their sex drive. Now, I think that could be a justifiable intervention, but it's not the treatment of a disease. It's for the protection of people. And that, I think, is the more honest and open way to describe what's happening. Now, here are some examples of how medicine has always done this. In the 1990s, when I was at Oxford, I wrote um, a paper about the ethics of volunteering children to be bone, do bone marrow donors for their siblings who have leukaemia and there's no suitable donor. That exposes the healthy child to a 1 in 100,000 chance of death from the anaesthesia and the complications of bone marrow harvesting, which are not insignificant. Is it unacceptable? No, I think it is acceptable. But it's not acting in that child's best interests. It's acti actually inflicting a disease on the child for the benefit of the other other child. More recently, you might be familiar with the creation of saviour siblings using in vitro fertilisation techniques and genetic testing technologies to enable people to have another child who is a matched stem cell donor for a sick child. This isn't treating or preventing disease, but I think it's legitimate because the risks, in fact, there are no risks. This child wouldn't exist otherwise. And in the more recent cases, the cells are taken from the umbilical cord so the procedure doesn't harm the new child, but it's not treating or preventing a disease in the child that you're creating. It's doing it for the other child. One of my most, my, my most um, favourite cases of, of um, this sort of procedure was in Oxford, and Sir Peter Morris, who's also Australian, he's the uh, head of uh, kidney surgery, and pioneered um, renal transplantation, was faced with this dilemma of a man who had two boys with a genetic disorder called Allport syndrome. Now this causes renal failure uh, in adulthood and both of the boys had renal failure, they're both on dialysis. And because of the tissue type, they were very unlikely to ever get a transplant from the, from the, from the, um, the cadaveric list. So the father do donated one of his own live kidneys to one son which is perfectly acceptable and everyone thinks that, again, that's not treating and preventing a disease in him, it's benefiting the son. It's using medicine to harm him to benefit the son. But the risk is small because, you know, the chance of getting renal failure in the long term, small, the chance of dying from the operation, small, but said to be reasonable. But then he said, I want to donate my second kidney to my second son because he's, he's got his life ahead of him and I've had my life. He was in his 60s. He said, you know, I, I, I would prefer to be on renal dialysis myself and my son receive the second kidney. And Peter Morris wouldn't do this because he said, you know, I'm not going to put this man, my patient, into renal failure for the sake, even for the sake of, you know, benefiting his son. And I think that was the wrong decision because the previous operation had inflicted a harm on him and a risk of renal failure. This was just a greater harm, but one that he judged was worth taking 
And it's arguable that he, he was right, that his son would benefit more. So that would have been a case of medicine being used to harm one individual to benefit another, but a legitimate one, because there were good reasons to do it. Other cases I've discussed in the literature, involuntary treatment of women in pregnancy, when their actions will not kill their fetus, causing an abortion, but will leave the fetus permanently brain damaged. Now, I think it's legitimate to perform an emergency caesarean section when a baby will be born with brain damage that was avoidable because I can't inflict brain damage on any of you um, for whatever reason and that's a grave harm to you and it's so it is for the future child that that fetus will become. A recent case of, the, of illustrating how medicine does harm some patients to benefit others is the lethal separation of conjoined twins. There was a famous case in the UK which was replicated in Brazil recently where Mary and Jody, born uh, in Manchester, I think. The parents were Cypriots, I think. And one, I think it was Mary, was the, or Jody was the smaller twin and was going to die. And if allowed to continue to live, would have, the other twin would have high, had a high chance of dying. And, and the courts describe this as the, uh, the, the, the smaller twin as being a parasite on the other. So it was legitimate to remove the parasite and, and kill that twin. Now that's a complete misdescription because both of these twins come from a single embryo that splits. So there isn't a, a, a greater entitlement of one twin to the other. They go, both go back to the same embryo. But this was a convenient redescription because otherwise you would have to say that it's legitimate to kill one twin to increase the chances of another surviving. The selective reduction of multiple pregnancies when people have triplets or quadruplets Sometimes fetuses are killed in utero to increase the chance of the others surviving. Now, this is a very controversial application of medicine. It's not within the traditional goals of benefiting the patient that you're treating. I think it's legitimate, and I think the principles are these. When the harm to the patient is small and the benefit to the third party is great, especially in terms of prevention of grave harm, then it can be reasonable to perform these procedures. Now you might say, well, being killed is not a small harm. But if you're going to die otherwise, it is a small harm because you're going to inevitably die, but by that stage you will have compromised the second twin. So we should infringe on people's freedom as, 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 um, as little as possible in order to, to bring about the benefits to others. But these sorts of interventions can in some cases be justified on a ground of what's called easy rescue. When the harm to you is small and the benefit to others is very great, it can be legitimate. My, again, I'll, I'll close with this. My favourite example of this was in Cyprus. In the 1980s, Cyprus is, is a small um, uh, country in the Mediterranean. They have a huge problem with thalassemia a blood disorder that eventually kills you in your 20s and you require multiple transfusions, a lot of med medication, a lot of hospitalisation before you die. And, Thal and, and Cyprus was about to become bankrupt as a country because of so many people having thalassemia. Um, and in fact, the blood supply was about to run out. Now, this is a genetic disorder and if you have a couple um, and they, they appear to be healthy, but they're carriers of thalassemia, they have a one in four chance of having a child with thalassemia. So it's entirely predictable. And you can also do testing of the fetus and have an abortion and have a, go on to have another child. So what they could have done was say, this is so bad for society that we require people to have abortions if they're carrying a child with thalassemia. That would have treated the problem with thalassemia. But they didn't say that. In fact, the church took the lead and said, if you want to be married in the church, you both have to have carrier testing. So you both have to know if you're at risk of having a child with thalassemia, if you want to be married. They didn't say you had to have, go on and have testing of the pregnancy. They didn't say you had to go and have an abortion. That's all they said you have to have. But this was an infringement of their liberty. This wasn't benefiting them. This was saying, you know, you have to have a medical test if you want to be married in the church. Completely reasonable, I think. And what happened? 
they all decided to have <laughs> prenatal testing if they realised they were both at risk, and all decided their own free will to to go on and have a termination of pregnancy, and the problem was addressed with a minimal incursion of liberty. But that was the use of medicine for the benefit of others, just as vaccination does not necessarily benefit the child, it benefits the community by maintaining herd immunity. So what I've talked about here doesn't just apply to drugs, it applies to counselling, it applies to cognitive behavioural therapy, it applies to any intervention. I've argued that medicine is not just about treating and preventing disease as pathology or even as sort of hard psychiatric disease. It's about promoting the well-being and autonomy of people and not just the patient, but sometimes other people. So it's a very broad understanding of what medicine should be about. What differentiates medicine from education and other programs that promote people's well-being is that it employs the knowledge of biology and neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry and so on, knowledge from the biological sciences to generate interventions that enhance people's lives. But we should move away from thinking that disease alone is what's important in life. What's important in life is our well-being, how well our lives go, and not merely the correction of pathology. There should be limits, as the title says. Uh, what sh we should decide what is plausibly in people's interests according to a broad conception of their well-being. We should try to understand whether a desire for some intervention is purely auto properly autonomous. We should employ principles of distributive justice, and we should take account of the public interest. But in all of these cases, even when we consider these limits, there are still cases, many cases, where medicine should be more broadly understood than simply treating and preventing disease. So the little piece I wrote for the age is just a tip of an iceberg. People will want more and more things that enhance their lives. And the best example, a topic close to my heart, is ageing. And I'll finish with this. You know, I'll get, let you into a little secret. I have to lie on the bed every morning like a beetle on its back with my arms and my legs in the air as I try to put on my socks. Because I have a severe back problem from spondylosis and spondylolisthesis, but I prolapse a disc if I bend over in the morning. I hate this. You can't remember who people are. You can't remember what, what you were supposed to do. Um, you know, your body starts to fall apart. That, but that's completely normal. Aging is a normal thing. It's ha but it happens to people at different rates. It's probably obvious to all of you. <laughs> and I have not met one person that has enjoyed the effects of ageing. Okay. Now, when you intervene in impotence in men who get older, memory decline in people who get older, physical decline, that's not treating a disease. That's treating normality because it's absolutely normal to go deaf as you get older, the vision to become more long-sighted, you can have to get different glasses. That's all normal. Now, why shouldn't we intervene in those things if we can? Why is it wrong that men choose to take Viagra or people choose to try to improve their memories when they're naturally declining? So we should embrace the idea that we can understand normality as well as disease and use that knowledge to improve people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. A stimulating talk, and Julian, as he said, has agreed to respond to questions. Um, could I ask, when you ask a question, to provide your name and affiliation for the purposes of the recording? Could I also ask you to keep your questions reasonably succinct so that everyone has a fair go? And uh, to stop everyone having a fair go, initially at least, um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions we've prepared earlier, in a way. Uh, I'm going to start by asking Dr Stephanie Ward, a 2009 Menzies Scholar, now at Monash University, to ask the first question. But before she does so, could you make sure that you project your voices? This is a small room. We're not going to have amplification for the questions, but... Um, I'd like everyone to hear them, and if necessary, I'll repeat the question. Stephanie. 
Thank you. I'm Dr. Stephanie Ward. I'm an academic geriatrician at the Monash Aging Research Centre. I'm a practicing geriatrician. That means I'm a doctor specialising in older adults uh, with Western Health. And thank you for your talk. You made a very compelling argument for um, using medicine for life enhancement. I wonder if, if the converse uh, argument could also be made um, in respect that perhaps there could be a tightening of diagnostic criteria for some hard diagnoses. And I'm thinking of dementia, which is an area that I work extensively in. And dementia, unfortunately, there's a lot of research and a lot of developments in dementia, but the state of play at the moment is that we don't have a cure for dementia. And at a recent conference of my colleagues, they were surveyed about whether they would want to know when they had dementia, when um, did they want to know if they had dementia, if they were ever diagnosed, or did they want to know if they were at very, very high risk of dementia, um, developing dementia. And I was really surprised that a lot of my colleagues who work in this field didn't actually ever want to know if they developed this condition, because at the stage, it's a condition that doesn't have a cure. Uh, hopefully that will change in a few years' time, but do you think that when there's a disease um, or even a, a spec, if you're on that spectrum of some memory impairment, when there hasn't been something that's been proven to be very efficacious, that perhaps um, uh, expanded diagnostic criteria are not in, the, in a person's best interest or the best interest of their well-being? Um, well, thank you. Uh, let me just do a survey. There's, there is a gene, ApoE4, that if, I mean, you, I can't remember the exact figures, but if you have two copies of this gene, there's something like a, a, an a, over 80% chance that you'll get dementia um, around the age of 70. Very highly predictive. Uh, it's great to see so many friends here. Russell Coomer is a very old family friend. Thank you. <laughs> see you later. Um, but let's just say there was, again, the, the extreme example of this is Huntington's disease. And this is 100% genetic. So if you've got the gene, you know, you will get Huntington's disease and get dementia. Um, and ha can I ask you, if, if, if there was a genetic test for, you know, that was predictive of, de of getting dementia in the future, let's assume you don't have it now, um, <laughs> how many of you would want to have the test? <coughs> And how many of you wouldn't want to have the test? Okay. Now, I think it's irrational not to have the test. Okay. And, and here's the reason. Um, because, as Stephanie said, there's no treatment, no medical treatment. But life is just not about medical treatment. It's about planning. Daniel Kahneman, famous Nobel... I, I, again, I'm always ranting about this. The best book I've read in a long time is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's a famous psychologist who really under, you know, has spent his life studying people's psychology. And I asked him once after a lecture, what are, the two, what, what are the things that you think would really make a difference to how well people's lives go? What, what are the sort of psychological limitations that they have that, um, that mean that they don't lead as good lives as, as they could lead. And he said, the first thing is they, <clears throat> they don't realise that the things that provide rewards are the things that you're constantly attending to. So when you're with friends playing cards or something, you're enjoying their company all the time. When you buy an expensive car, you do enjoy it when you think about it or you look at it. But when you're driving, you don't get any enjoyment out of it or you're just driving a car. And most of the time people think that these endpoint, you know, markers of consumption and so on, are going to provide happiness, but it's it's usually activities that involve constant engagement, particularly with other people, that provide the most the most happiness. And the second thing is, he said, people view their life as an unending resource. They they don't conceive they don't conceive of their own death until they get a terminal diagnosis, and then they do. But they think that their life, and they don't plan for their life, and so they have a limited resource that they don't apportion and and structure. He said, that's a fundamental mistake. And I think this is an example of that mistake, because it's not just whether you can employ a treatment, which would be great if you could prevent it, but it's you can plan your career, you can plan your family, uh, you can plan you know, your travel, you can plan what you do with your life. And all of those things can have a profound effect on whether you, you know, if I told you you're going to die tomorrow, you probably wouldn't stay here. You'd go and do something else, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that you can do with this information besides 
um, besides employing medical interventions about life planning. Take out your superannuation. Start spending it. You know, there's a lot of things you could do. Anyway, so I think it's rational to get the information. But, you know, I'm not a... I'm Contrary to what they say in the press, I'm not a Nazi. I don't want to impose, you know, that rationality and so on onto you. But I think people should certainly be free to make those decisions. So, you know, I think that the best thing you can do is ask people in advance, what sorts of things do you want to know? And give the, those who do want to know the opportunity to know. Um, but worryingly... <laughs> Worryingly, this is not what happens even today in the medical profession. Sorry, I'm going on, but I think this is, I'll finish with this anecdote. Very nice guy in Oxford, Martin Turner, fantastic neurologist, specialises in motor neurone disease, and we were discussing ethics, and he goes, yeah, I had this guy, came in, had changes in his MRI, suggestive of early onset dementia, and then he had some problems with memory that we'd picked up on some tests, but he hadn't presented for diagnosis of dementia or, or because of the memory problems. It presented for some other reason. And I said, well, did you tell him about the findings? And he said, no, 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 of course not. And so he adopted exactly the, the approach of some of your colleagues that think, I wouldn't want to know, so you know, I don't think they should know. And I said, really? I said, but if that were you, wouldn't you want to know? And he said, oh, we can't open that can of worms <laughs> because that would create too, too So, you know, in fact, the, you're often not told about these things because of a kind of paternalism. Um, so I've had, I, I'll just finish, I've had the APOE4 test and get it through 23andMe, a genetic, commercial genetic testing company. And so I thought it was quite useful to know that. Uh, I'm Steve, I'm Steve I'm a psychiatrist at the Alfred Hospital. Um, a lot of the problems that you raise with DSM, I, we agree with entirely, and of course, as you know, they've created an enormous debate in the uh, medical literature and in the psychiatric community. The problem that the people like DSM face, though, is that it's essentially not a medical process, it's a community process of people with, um, of attempting to classify the experience of human nature, and that certain people want their um, experience to be classified so that they can access, get access to treatment and research. Um, certain groups are dead keen on, and in particular in the USA it's important because of course funding is based on it, it's not such an issue in Australia of course. So how, can the, how do you think the classifiers, in this case the DSM-5 committees, how do they get around this problem of the community wanting descriptions for their experience, researchers wanting names for the experiences so that they can get funding to research, companies, drug companies and the likes wanting names for the disorders so that they can provide treatments. Yeah. How can they get around and provide a fair balance for the community? Yeah, I think there, there, should be, there should be a division into sort of hard diseases like cancer, Parkinson's disease, you know, malaria, and, and looking at whether you can get, um, a, you know, a, a pathobiological understanding of some psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia or manic depression. And then there should be a new category of psychological limitations or, you know, some other category to describe all of these life experiences that are disadvantageous, um, but not put them in the same. Because what you find now is that, you know, that at some point there'll be a competition between treatment of, of some forms of cancer or breast, you know, advanced breast cancer with symptom reduction versus, you know, general unhappiness. Uh, and, and because they're both, they're both, they're both, you know, they're both diseases and, you know, need to be sort of treated in the same way. And I think it would be better if we split them into sort of hard diseases and things which represent disadvantages or disadvantageous conditions or limiting conditions or, or whatever, and still did all that research and still funded some of them um, without giving them the, the disease label. I mean, what appears in, in textbooks of pathology are what... I think are best described as, as disease. And Christopher Bohr's, a famous philosopher of science about 40 years ago, said the best definition of disease is this biostatistical definition that you, your sub-functioning, so it's a statistical deviation from what's normal for your species um, that leads to lower survival and reproduction. And people have tried to extend that to things like, you know, homosexuality, shyness, social anxiety and so on. And I think that's just we're dealing with new phenomena now, and I think we need to. That's we really need to re revisit our concepts and create new categories, not keep extending the ones that we had. Another area that I talked about in the past is disability. Now there are two models: the the, the biological medical model, which is again a 
sub-functioning, statistical sub-functioning model, a social model that, that many people with disabilities say, no, it's the way in which society has been constructed that, that disadvantages us, not anything to do with being blind or deaf and so on. Now, I've argued that both of those models are now inappropriate and that we should have a, a different model. So in many cases, you know, I think we, we can't just try to pack in what's happening continually into... And, and a great example of this was brain death. I mean, you know, until I think it was the 50s, you were dead when your heart and lungs stopped working and then it became possible to do organ transplants for other people. So again, it was the use of medicine for other people. So then they said, no, no, you're not dead when your heart and lungs stop beating. You can also be dead when your brain stops fucking and then we can also take your heart and lungs because you're already dead. And this was a fantastic, you know, reconceptualization for the purposes, of quite legitimate social purposes. But it's not as if somebody discovered something about death at that point that wasn't known before. They made the decision to describe death in a different way. And I think that we can, you know, we need to employ that sort of thinking more, more generally to medicine. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I found your talk quite fascinating. It certainly covers many, many aspects. But the one that really interests me, sorry, I'm Sue Carl, I'm Director of Independent Pastoral Care. Um, I'd like to ask a question, why is it that a more holistic approach isn't being accepted? Because it's acknowledged we are physical, mental and spiritual beings, but in my experience over the last 40 years of nursing as a registered nurse and working in many aspects of medicine, um, the spiritual is constantly denied by medical professionals, certainly now more recently by mental health professionals and by scientists. Now, uh, there in the um, Mosby's Medical um, Dictionary, there's a definition of spiritual distress, which is distress of the human spirit. When you're saying we need to look more broadly to new um, directions, why is it that the spiritual isn't being incorporated in a more holistic approach? Why are there so many blocks to say there is a, a role for the spiritual, there is a creator spirit, and this is why a lot of the problems aren't being resolved? Well, um, people have struggled even to define what health is and how to measure health. So this has been a huge problem you know, in, in allocating health resources and prioritising um, you know, healthcare around the world. And the WHO, after the Second World War, described health as complete biological, psychological and social functioning. Um, and we've got nowhere near measuring what that is. So in terms of you know, being able to kind of give hard currency to, to measuring outcomes of interventions, it's been very difficult even to compare life prolonging versus quality of life enhancing treatments and people have invented quality adjusted life years. So if you like, people have moved beyond just life extension. But what I've argued for is moving to a more global evaluation of well-being as incorporating three dimensions. Happiness, desire, fulfilment and objectively valuable features of the person, their ability to to take part in society, to achieve things. and so Now, you might add a spiritual dimension to that. Now, why have they not done this? Because it's very difficult to measure those things. Or, and how, you know, how would we know how much spiritual benefit one person is getting versus another when we have to decide who? So I think part of it is we haven't, we've, we've still fairly immature in what the outcome measures of medicine are. And I agree with you, the, the sort of, the, the real debate, I think, should be about you know, how should we measure how good a medicine is or how good an intervention is? Just as like, how should we measure whether society is successful? You know, we used to be a GDP. Oh, they've got a higher GDP. They're economically more productive. Well, that's such a narrow measurement. And people have talked about gross happiness indexes and so on. And that's, again, a very fairly narrow measure. What you want is a gross well-being measurement. But maybe you want a gross well-being plus spiritual measurement. But that, I think, is all, you know, quite some way off from where we are at the moment in terms of discussion. Yes. My name is Craig Wheel and I'm a clinician and professor of addiction medicine. Enjoyed your presentation uh, and enjoyed uh, thinking fast and slow. Could I put it to you that you confused us a little with a little question. We're talking about dementia 
and somebody who had clinical or in, uh, evidence of it and would you want to know what you threw at us was risk factors in somebody that was well. And I'd like you to uh, tell us a little bit about the ethics, because one of the things that worries me is if that database is accessed by somebody else, you're likely to get your superannuation perhaps withdrawn. You're certainly likely to have loadings put on uh, life insurance, for example, where you've got a risk factor but not actually have the disease and you may never get the disease. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, there are downsides to knowing your risk profile in greater detail, as you said, uh, you know, very correctly. Um, and, and I think that that for that reason, that, that people should make their own choices and they should know what the, what the benefits are and what the risks are. So in terms of life insurance, if you have genetic testing after you've taken out a life insurance policy, it won't affect your premium, okay? We don't have, uh, I mean, it, and the same would apply to, to health insurance, I would say. So it's important to know that if you're thinking about doing thing, these things, it's better to take out your life insurance and your <laughs> <laughs> before you have the tests, because you then do have a duty to disclose the information. Um, so I think there are ways of using this in a way that, that can help people to make better choices about their lives. Um, can it be accessed by other people? Well, of course it can, um, and, and there should be proper routes of compensation and, and redress for that. But I don't think that's, I mean, you know, do you know what the most effective predictor of epidemics is in the world? Is it the CDC? Is it CSIRO? Is it, you know, it's Google. And you know why? Because they just work out whether there are lots of inquiries, you know, into the symptoms of influence. So they can tell you way before the CDC does that there's an outbreak of, of flu in some little tiny town in, in, in you know, in America. Google knows much more about you than anyone will. <laughs> so. You know, it's important to put these things into context and the sort of world that we're living in. And I don't think that the you know abuse of, of you having genetic tests is going to be your biggest worry. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't. I, I know. I well, I don't know how it is now, but I I knew of a couple of cases of people who were inappropriately loaded when they had genetic testing in the 90s for Huntington's and so on because the the companies didn't understand what the, themselves didn't understand what the risk factors are. So a good example of this is hemichromatosis. I can't remember the figures. This looks like there's lots of doctors here. Something's a one in three hundred people. You know, very common genetic disorder. Okay, it's it's eminently treatable. You just donate blood regularly. Okay, um, and if you don't, you get liver liver failure, heart failure, diabetes, and so on. Now, why shouldn't you have uh, the predictive testing and find out whether you you know are likely to have well, whether you do have hemochromatosis and engage in a, a treatment program. Um, if you if you actually have the treatment, if you donate the blood, you're at lower risk than the average person of getting hemochromatosis because there's people out there who don't know that they've got it. So you should be a better bet for an insurance company. So if an insurance company disadvantages you, they're not understanding what it, you know what the what actuarial risk is that you represent on treatment. And you'd have a case of, of redress against that. It's a treatable disease and you can challenge it. In fact, I have to. As a <laughs> gastroenterologist, I've challenged it right. for, yeah. for some patients. Yeah. And you, have you been successful? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the system is not perfect. But I think you know, we, should we, we should try to use this information to, as much as we can. Catherine Murray from a Developmental Paediatrician. Can I extend that a bit further? Because one of the tests that's freely available to me now with Medicare funding is a microarray that gives me lots of information about a person's genetic makeup. And sometimes the particular gene problem that you're looking for is next to another gene that may have much wider implications for the health and well-being of the extended family members. What are the ethics of me doing that test? Well, I mean, I used to get this a lot when I used to be genetic. Um, so I, I, there's a couple of questions in there. So one is, what, what are the ethics of doing one test but finding out that you find something else that's of relevance to that patient? Okay, leave, leave aside the family for the moment, okay? Now, here, I think if there's... If there's a clear benefit, you know, if there are interventions and so on, that preventative interventions, then it's it's very important to tell them. If not, I think what should have happened at the um, 
at the consent stage, given that you know that this is a risk, is that you say, if we find other things in these sorts of categories, you know, would you want us to tell you these or not? So that you, know, you can get an idea of the person's preferences about those sorts of things before you do the test, rather than trying to guess what they want after they've had the test. So I think it's a part of the, of the information about the test that, like, it, it, it's meant to, there's meant to be an equality of information between the health provider and the patient. And so when you obviously know that this is a risk and a problem, and the patient should also know it's a risk and a problem before they, before they have the test. Now, the same principle broadly applies, I think, to disclosure to other family members. So it used to be, I, I can't remember the, but, you know, for say, um, you know, say there's a familial bowel cancer gene that you turn up that, that will have implications for other people and there are clear treatments and preventions. And the patient says, you know, I don't want to know or I don't want my, the other members of my family to be told. Okay. Here I think the, this idea of doing medicine not just for the patient in front of you but for other people is very important. And I think that, that information should be pr passed on when there are clear preventative strategies available to them. And I think that the a part of the disclosure at consent stage should be, we will tell your family members if we discover a genetic disorder um, that has a, has a preventative strategy that is relevant to them. And if they choose to have the test, they, they've consented to the disclosure. Now that's quite a strong approach. Many people wouldn't do that. They would give the patient discretion over the disclosure of that information. Um, but I personally think it should be disclosed. And I think the more kind of, um, the more liberal position is simply to inform the patient beforehand that you would disclose that sort of information. Because you know, why should somebody die of bowel cancer that was completely preventable for the sake of you know, a person's whim or kind of maliciousness or so, you know, that's contentious, um, but I, I think that the duty to warn others is, is, a, is a reasonably strong one. Well, well, I just, just, I guess that more often know what is found may not have been treatment available. And, and that's, it's never as black and white as I think you've got. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we're just having a kind of short discussion here. here. <laughs> obviously, life is very complicated, and you know, and again, these are, you know, these are just arguments to be considered. And you know, I I think that it's it's correct that there, are, just as there isn't health and disease, there isn't you know, um, just genes that have you know, lead to conditions that have treatments and genes that don't. But I think you could you could try to categorise them into groups. Yeah, maybe three or four broad categories, um, and then elicit patient preferences on those sorts of things. Um, now maybe this is too resource intensive, but that you ask always yourself. One of the most fundamental ethical principle that's embodied in Christianity and all the world's religions is the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and this is in philosophy called universalizability. So the idea is you should, you know, the right decision is the one that you can endorse. No matter who you are in the kind of pattern of people performing the action or affected by it. So in this case, ask, what would you want if you were the patient in this situation? Or what would you want if you were the family? And, you know, if I were the patient, I would want to know these different sorts of categories and what you're going to do or what you're going to advise me to do or what you're not going to tell me about you know, at the end of it. That's, that's what I would want. Maybe, maybe I'm bizarre, but um, I like to have lots of information. Okay, I think we've got time for about two more questions. So there's one here and one up the back. Ruth Williams from the School of Economics at La Trobe University. Um, economics is also um, a discipline of practical ethics from a different perspective. And I found your talk today very informative, fleshing out the, uh, putting flesh on various bones. Um, my question is this, and it comes from um, the perspective of being an economist who's done empirical work on the things that you're referring to. Um, empirical work across the whole population of Australia that suggests on um, both time series and cross-section data that, that the epidemiological structure of the population subject to mental illness doesn't reflect anything like the service use, which suggests that there's a major structural imbalance. Um, and every decision 
over a resource is subject to an opportunity cost, which is the harsh ethic of economics. But it also determines who lives and who dies and who has access to a better life. Now, in across a spectrum of mental disorders, there are people subject to serious mental disorders and people subject to mild mental disorders. Um, and the perennial question is how to match up need with resource use. And there's plenty of evidence. No, there's not plenty of evidence. There is strong suggestion that it's not a particularly good match in the mental health sector. I think the match is very good with respect to bread. If you, if you, if you need bread, you buy it. If you want bread, um, someone who's, um, someone who's, um, let's think of another thing, um, someone who is a vegetarian doesn't buy meat. And so the, the resource allocation is very tight in those types of products. But in mental illness, it's a severe mismatch. Yeah. Now, my question is this. It makes me wonder if under Medicare, so there's been a, an increase in demand for um, diagnoses, that's a bit of a loose term, as well as a, an increase in supply. But under conditions of moral hazard, um, under the public purpose <coughs> of Medicare, as opposed to private insurance, I wonder if the definitions, I wonder if government is sidestepping. Um, we've got a, a huge diagnostic um, basis of Medicare for physical diseases. There's items, um, very tight items, and the decision is do I do it or don't I? But under mental illness, it seems to me to be a big gap. I'm speaking as an economist. I don't know if you'd see it as the same, but that's my question. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a very complicated series of issues that you've raised and i just say one thing that um part of the problem might be and, and this is sort of criticism of economics is that you know there's sort of terms that you used you know demand for um and the preferences that people have and so on don't work at all well in mental illness because you've got disordered preferences and people's preferences you know are in severe cases not tracking you know their interests and you know, it, it makes it's crazy to say what they want is what's good for them in the case of sort of severe mental illness, and I and I I think that there's a huge problem in medicine in general of evaluating outcomes purely subjectively. So you know, if you if you look at people's happiness and life satisfaction after they become paraplegic, you know, initially it's terrible, and then their happiness levels come back to virtually normal. So if you adopt a sort of subjective measure uh, or a preference, you know, crude preference satisfaction evaluation of their of their quality of life at that point, you say there's nothing wrong with them now because you know their levels are the same. But of course there's something wrong with them. They can't walk. And I think for that reason you need not just subjective measures, you need objective measures. And so my answer to this would be, you know, that that problem that you that you, this sort of miss like I can't remember the terms you actually use, but the the disconnection between where you think the services should be going and where they are actually going I think is is partly because we don't we don't employ objective measures of 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 need priority and so on in the case of severe mental illness as a so mildly disordered people will be kind of very vocal and very active in obtaining kind of resources where people who really need it the most you know really objectively is you know may may not want it at all <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but they will that will contribute at a population. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Barlow. I'm a psychotherapist. Would like to thank you very much for a very very stimulating talk. Um, it seems to me that you're arguing for the extension of medical science into the field of phenomenology, and that uh, you then argue when 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 one does that. One then argues for the application of uh, scientific method into the field of phenomenology. And the question then arises for me, is that an appropriate use of science? Whether in fact uh, what we should be doing is uh, limiting more what doctors should be doing in the field of so-called mental illness uh, so that uh, the hardcore mental illnesses that you talk about uh, can be clearly worked uh, with uh, in the medical profession and that other areas of human experience 
which have now been medicalised could be worked with by other professionals. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, just a, it's an empirical question, who will make the best progress in those other areas? And I simply used medicine because they've currently been involved in those other areas. And, and you know, I was arguing that, that that's legitimate, but, it's, it's, but you're completely correct. There may be lots of better ways of addressing the limitations and, as you put it, the phenomenology um, than, than through the traditional medical route. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, psychiatry... I mean, I entered medicine to do psychiatry. I thought it was fantastic specialty, you know, understanding the mind, the person, you know, spirit, you know, all this sort of... Stuff. And then I got to do... <laughs> I got to do psychiatry, and it was basically giving people major tranquilizer. It was like medicine 100 years before. And, and my friend Paul McMurray, who's now a bowel surgeon, said to our psychiatry lecturer, Nick Kex, who I, ga I gather is quite high up in psychiatry now, he said, isn't ECT a bit like kicking the television when it doesn't work? <laughs> and, and at that point, you know, I left psychiatry to, to work in neurology. And I, I thought that, you know, I, there was always this biological psychiatry movement. Maybe it succeeded. But, you know, I, I always thought that, that, you know, psychiatry should be more focused on... on Developing an under you know pathological understanding of, of of psychiatry and dealing with it as as it was in other areas of medicine and those other things dealt with you know in a in a kind of in a different way so you know I'm I'm very sympathetic to what you say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Savalescu. I'd like to invite uh, uh, Professor Matthews to uh, um, say a formal thank you and present you. Julian. Thank you. Um, a small token of appreciation from all of us. Uh, we won't ask you to open the box, but it uh, harks back to the Menzies name because it's uh, a bottle of uh, Menzies red wine from uh, the Coonawarra estate. And uh, this is not a free advertisement. We don't have any <laughs> commercial interest in the, uh, in the wine, but... Uh, it's a certain symmetry and a, a nice way of saying thank you on behalf of all of us for a very stimulating lecture. And thank you all for coming. And there will be some light refreshments outside on the landing. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much.